Hey, what is up, folks? Welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all having the best week possible. So in a previous reaction video, we learned all about how the Star Spangled Ban Banner came about. Francis Scott Key, an American lawyer, wrote a poem about what he saw during the 1812 war, and those words would eventually become the Star Spangled Banner, the most famous national anthem in the whole entire world world now when we watched that video despite the story being very inspiring many folks said that there were some inaccuracies so i thought i'd learn more about the 1812 war as a whole and get a more holistic accurate view of things so without further delay we're going to be reacting to the british american war of 1812 explained in 13 minutes i cannot wait for this one this should be amazing let's go in 1812 the young nation of the United States took on the country with the most powerful navy in the world in a war that would affect more than just the former colonies and their colonizer. So let's, so basically the American Revolutionary War, you know, took place probably around 40 years prior to this. So at this point, you know, America was independent in its own sovereign country. For about 40 years, I would say, right, guys? Or maybe 20 years? 20 years, yeah. So some time has passed where America and the UK are totally separated, but still there ex clearly exists some tension. The United States of America first gained freedom from the British in an eight-year-long revolutionary war that finally came to a close when Britain inevitably recognized the independence of their 13 former colonies on September 3rd, 1783. One of the most relevant impacts of this war that would fuel future tensions between the US and Britain once again was the role of the Native Americans. During the revolution, the Native Americans mostly supported the Brits, who they hoped would continue to restrict expansion from the U.S. settlers into Native American territory. Right. When Britain failed to maintain its rule over the colonies, the United States eventually accelerated its takeover of Native land, causing even more friction between the American societies. This friction only grew stronger as the years went on, as Britain remained a driving force of the discord since not only had the Natives taken its side in the revolution, but the British also openly encouraged the Native Americans to fight back against their antagonists. So it's interesting to know, at least from a foreigner's point of view, that even though, you know, Britain acknowledged America now as its own sovereign state, independent from, you know, colonization, they still weren't too happy about it. You know, few decades later it's still hurting them that this happened and they're actually encouraging you know these native folk to cause some disruption so very interesting by 1812 this combined with a few other factors led to the development of a new war while the United States was clearly unhappy with the united opposition from Britain and the natives, they were also infuriated by allegations that the Royal Navy was utilizing a tactic known as impressment to take U.S. men for their own troops. On top oh. of this, the ongoing strife between Britain and France had a notable impact on the United States. Heavily locked in their own struggle, the warring nations tried to restrict trade from neutral countries and punish anyone who attempted to ignore the constraints. This put the United States in a detrimental position due to their inability to continue trade with either nation unless they wanted to risk invoking the wrath of the other side. Oh, okay. While France took a more laid-back approach to to ensure the U.S. abstained from doing business with the British, the latter was more aggressive about the matter. On mm. January 7th, 1807, Britain issued an order in council stating, It is hereby ordered that no vessel shall be permitted to trade from one port to another, both which ports shall belong to or be in the possession of France or her allies, or shall be so far under their control as the British vessels may not freely trade. Furthermore, any ships that 
refused to obey these restrictions would be subject to seizure by the Royal Navy, cargo and all. By November, the original order was expanded, now to include all the ports and places of France and her allies, or of any other country at war with His Majesty, and all other ports or places in Europe, from which, although not at war with His Majesty, the British flag is excluded, and all ports or places in the colonies belonging to His Majesty's enemies. In it's quite crazy how much, you know, of an impact and how much power, you know, Britain still had at this point. You know, they had the, supposedly they had the largest and most destructive navy in all of the lands. And obviously how times have changed. Now you compare the British Navy to, you know, America's Navy or the or America's Navy fleet. And it's not even a comparison. Obviously, America and Britain are allies today, no doubt. But Back in these days, you know, America was still finding their feet. And that's what makes, you know, America's battles during this point so inspiring because they most likely didn't have, you know, the resources that Britain had at that point, yet they were still managed, they still managed to fend them off time after time. In retaliation, France, under the command of Napoleon Bonaparte, issued the Milan Decree, which said that every ship to whatever nation it may belong that shall have submitted to be searched by an English ship or to a voyage to England or shall have paid any tax whatsoever to the English government is thereby and for that alone declared to be denationalized, wow. to have forfeited the protection of its king and to have become English property. Wow. Okay. Adding on, Napoleon declared that any of the aforementioned ships that enter French ports or those of French allies are good and lawful prizes of his nation. Forced to reply, U.S. President Thomas Jefferson signed the Embargo Act in December of 1807, blocking all international trade from American ports and taking direct aim at Britain. Wow. Unfortunately for America, the act backfired and turned the U.S. into more of a victim than anyone else. Emphasizing this point, the Minister to France himself even said, Here it is not felt, and in England it is forgotten. The effects of the Embargo Act ultimately pushed the U.S. into an economic depression, and it had to be repealed less than two years after the initial That's signature. So backfire, In eh? its place, the Non-Intercourse Act was passed, which directly forbade trade with Britain and France and their colonies. When this new act still proved to be ineffective, the United States tried once again, this time passing Macon's Bill No. 2 in May of 1810. This bill lifted trading bans and stated that if either France or Britain removed their own restrictions, the U.S. would re-establish an embargo with the opposing nation. By August, Napoleon enacted a plan to exacerbate tension between Britain and the United States, and it ultimately worked. He first told the new president, James Madison, that he intended to exempt the U.S. from his previously established Berlin and Milan decrees, promoting Madison to bring back the Non-Intercourse Act constraints against Britain in November of that year. Despite the fact that Napoleon never actually followed through on his proclamation, Britain and the United States were now on the brink of all-out war. The final straw. So this was now two years, right? This is 1810, so two years before the war broke out. Wow. Interesting stuff. I never actually knew all the context that resulted in this you know, conflict you know, originating between the two sides. came when the Battle of Tippecanoe unfolded in late 1811, as the U.S. troops claimed victory over the Native Americans, wishing to stop further expansion once again. Given the United States was fairly confident in the belief that the British were supplying the natives with weapons from Canada, a faction of the U.S. Republican Party known as the Warhawks began a heavy push towards an official declaration of war. At last, on June 18, 1811, 1812, President James Madison signed the Declaration Against Britain, despite contention about the issue coming from both the House and Senate. Another problem emerged as well when Britain decided to suddenly repeal their trade restrictions before news of the U.S. declaration of war actually reached the British over a month later. Aware of this delay, Britain decided not to immediately respond to the call of war and waited to see 
how the Americans would react to their repeals. When the US got wind of this surprising development, they were, in turn, unsure of how the Brits would react to their declaration of war. Right. Ultimately, the United States decided to follow through on its proclamation and did so by invading Canada, which was a British colony at the time. While the American troops hoped to capture Canadian land to force Britain into negotiation, they had no such success. No one was prepared for war. The British and French had been busy fighting their own battles, and the US military was grossly ill-suited to take on the likes of Britain. The defeats were plenty and humiliating for the Americans. One excessively humbling loss for the US happened when General William Hull surrendered Fort Detroit on August 16, 1812, and his own army to the British troops, and allowed Michigan territory to be deemed as part of Britain. Chased a so that must have been a very, very bitter pill to swallow. You're trying to infiltrate land beyond your borders, but in fact, you end up losing ground upon your own land, and you have to concede in this point of time, Michigan to, to Great Britain. So that would have been very, very difficult for, you know, the American faithful to, you know, concede for sure. Across the Canadian border, as Hull saw the size of his opponent's forces, which was a mix of British and Native American troops, and knowing that his daughter and grandchild were in the fort, he decided to give up without a single shot being fired. Hull's disgraceful failure led to an uptick in Native American raids in the Northwest and British conflict under the command of Major General Henry Proctor. Adding insult to injury, U.S. Brigadier General Henry Dearborn struggled to make any progress on the northeastern border because the militia there's Boston, baby. Let's go. ...in New England were not supportive of the war and uninterested in coming together for an attack on Montreal. By October, the Americans were finally able to get some momentum as Major General Stephen von Rensselaer led an army of 3,100 militiamen into the Battle of Queenston Heights. Rensselaer sent some advanced units across the river where they were able to hold their ground for some time on a slope just above Queenston and were successful until they were overcome by British forces as the rest of the American troops refused to join the fight. 925 U.S. soldiers were then captured by the British, despite Damn. Major General Isaac Brock on the British side being killed during the battle. Yet again, the Americans took another hit in 1813 when an attempt to retake Detroit resulted in a massacre of U.S. prisoners by their Native American opponents. Oh, on man. top of that, Brigadier General Henry Sad. Dearborn was replaced by Major General James Wilkins. At long last, though, in September of 1813, U.S. Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry scored a major naval victory at Lake Erie against the forces of British Captain Robert Barclay and opened the gates for more success on the American side. When the Battle of the Thames erupted the following month, the U.S. finally defeated the British and Native American Allied forces the next spring season at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Okay, so yes, in summary, I guess at that point, they reclaimed Michigan, it looks like. So at this point, we're back, we're back on even, we're back in even Stevens, right? Because we lost Michigan and now uh, a year or two after the war started, this is around 1813, 1814, regained Michigan. So we're back to square one, but at least we're no longer you know, conceding land, we've recaptured our land, which is great. And when I say our, I mean, you know, United States. A U.S. militia force faced off with a Native American force known as the Red Sticks and found victory once again, demanding that the losing side cede roughly 23 million acres of land, Ooh. which would later become Ooh. Alabama and span partially into Georgia. Another win for the United States followed in the summer, July of 1814, at the Battle of Chippewa, but it was short-lived as the Battle of Lundy's Lane ended in a bloody stalemate shortly after. By the way, it just reminds me when he said that 23 million acres of land eventually gave rise to Alabama, Georgia. Folks, I'm going to see you at some point. I am going to visit the south of the United States. I think that might be destination one. Alabama, Georgia, Texas. Those are the areas I'm thinking of. 
forcing the Americans to withdraw. The real deciding factor in the war came when Napoleon faced his first exile, allowing Britain to shift more focus to the discord with the United States. The British sliced through the US, destroying government buildings including the White House as they took control of Washington DC. The Brits then tried to push farther into Baltimore by September under the authority of General Robert Ross, but were repulsed at the Battle of North Point where General Ross was killed. In the battle that inspired the US National Anthem, more Let's British troops go. were fought off at Fort McHenry. As these conflicts raged on, peace talks began in Ghent and eventually resulted in a signed treaty on December 24th, 1814. Mm -hmm. Still, just as with the declaration of war, the news was delayed and took until February 18th, 1815 to officially be ratified and end the war. The Treaty of Ghent reverted things back mostly to how they were before the combat with a status quo antebellum. All territory was returned. Britain repealed their trade restrictions, stopped supporting the Native American revolts, and ended their impressment strategies. In the end, the war was essentially a draw, and the only real losing side was the Native Americans, who had high hopes for British help in stopping US expansion. Britain right. was able to claim victory against the French, and in a way, against the US. Meanwhile, the US had the pride of more or less winning their second war of independence. Right, so I guess from different sides of the argument, people can claim they won or this person or this country won. I feel like America won the moral victory because they were able to fend off a very, very powerful military at that time in human history. The British Navy, for instance, that was attacking Fort McHenry was definitely, definitely far exceeded the numbers that the U.S. had, yet the U.S. were able to fight them off. They kept the flag waving. They kept the flag upright. And that battle inspired much of Francis Scott Key's uh, words that eventually formed part of the national anthem. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I love the fact that I do have some greater context as to what caused you know, the war between these two sides again, and some of the happenings that took place during the war. I think I do want to react to another video in more detail about Fort McHenry itself. I want to get maybe a 20 minute video on that specific battle because that was the one that, you know, I guess culminated in the war ending when the Americans fought the British off. So yeah, folks, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Always enjoy watching and reacting and learning about us history i hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as i did and i hope this video ignites you know some pride because sometimes there's so much you know bad news happening in the world it's easy to get bogged down so it's good to listen and react to some of these more uplifting stories but yeah let me know what you think of this battle uh did you learn a lot about it when you were younger um let me know if there's anything that this video missed that might be important for me to know, I'd highly appreciate it. But folks, until next time, I hope you have a good one. I'll see you when I see you. Cheers.